Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Claire Mia. I'm the Director of Nursing Continuing Professional Development here at the LSU School of Nursing. We welcome you. We give you a warm welcome for today's barriers and strategies for implementing evidence-based practice. Just a few introductory slides and information for our continuing education for nurses. The Louisiana State Health New Orleans School of Nursing Nursing Continuing Professional Development Department is accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center. And for the nurses in the audience, those of you that are participating, you may earn 1.5 nursing continuing professional development contact hours today. Each nursing participant, the requirements are that you must attend the entire session and complete the evaluation to receive credit. We also want to disclose that our planning committee and presenters for today do not have any relevant financial relationships to disclose with any ineligible companies. So we will not be promoting any products that are used on patients. Your instructions to receive your certificates. What I want you to note is the email address in the center of the screen. We will be emailing the evaluation to everyone via this email address to the email that you registered for today's webinar with. The also important thing is that the date you see in the bottom left, Wednesday, June the 21st, the link will be deactivated, so you will not be able to claim your credit. So please do take time within the next two weeks. You should expect the link to arrive this afternoon once we verify attendance for today's webinar. So please do uh, do that and be honest, give us some honest feedback. It is how we improve our nursing professional development programs. Today's event is a, a JBI local event and we do have a, a welcome to play from Professor Zoe Jordan, who is the executive director of JBI. Hello and welcome to the JBI Global Solution Room. This is an event that's really designed to engage clinicians in getting evidence into practice. For those of you who perhaps aren't familiar with JBI, we really are all about getting evidence into practice. So using the best evidence to get good outcomes and create a brighter future. Now recently, in recent years, I've been thinking a little bit um, about this idea of a flywheel effect and the original concept came from a guy called Jim Collins. And what Jim talks about is the fact that organisational change never really happens in one fell swoop. Um, you know, th there's no magic bullet, there's no solitary lucky break. It's about having consistent attention um, to something to, to drive change and, you know, to make organisational change happen. And I really felt like this has got some um, useful synergy with evidence-based healthcare and the forces that drive the successful translation of evidence into practice. Hopefully, most of you are familiar with the JBI model, um, and we've recently published a paper about an, the idea of an evidence-based healthcare flywheel. Um, and what we did when we redeveloped the model in 2019 was to add these, we call them overarching principles, but they're, they're underneath, so they're kind of foundational principles um, around culture, communication, collaboration and capacity. And really we see these as the catalytic mechanisms that are required to successfully drive forward evidence-based healthcare initiatives in organisations. Now, we certainly recognise that evidence-based healthcare is relational. It's not transactional. And if we, if we want to empower people to change their behaviour, then we really need to give some careful, thoughtful and consistent attention to navigating the, the relational matrices that, that organisations um, are run by. 
know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We just want to get it moving. Yeah. And so, as you can see by this um, graphic, we really feel like those four C's that we added um, several years ago to the model uh, are the drivers of the momentum required to get evidence into practice. And I think that's a really important focus area that we probably haven't paid sufficient attention to. Um, we don't talk about them very much, we don't articulate them, but we know that they are the things that, that require attention in order to see change happen successfully. So I'm really excited that this week we have 35 local events happening. Now you have to remember that this is an event that started as the local solution room here in Adelaide um, a few years ago. And really it was just an effort um, on our part to re-engage with stakeholders across South Australia. But when we shared the concept with our international collaboration, they were really excited by it. And so over the years, we've seen the number of events um, grow, and now we have an extraordinary number of events happening, which is just so exciting for us to see. Um, we know that change can happen with just one pebble, with just one person. And so um, we're excited to see the ripple effect of change that came out of that one event. And we're excited to see the ripples that will now flow across the world. I hope that whatever event you're participating in um, this week, that you have a really enjoyable time. And I look forward to hearing more about them. Thank you. Well, again, welcome to our global event. We'll have Dr. Demetrius Porsche give us an introduction to JBI and also institutional description um, with, of our event today. Dr. Porsche is a professor and dean of Louisiana State University Health Science Center School of Nursing. He holds an appointment also in the School of Public Health and the School of Graduate Studies here at LSU HSC, and he currently serves as the director of our Louisiana Center for Promotion of Optimal Health Outcomes, which is a JBI Center of Excellence. Dr. Porsche, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mayette. So I uh, have the privilege of giving you a further welcome and introduction to not only JBI, but also their evidence-based practice model. And then also what is this G Local Solutions Room that we're actually in today. As uh, Professor Jordan has said, we are in a collaborative across the entire world. So today's event is happening across the country. So what uh, basically, who are we as a JBI entity? We at LSU School of Nursing, we have the privilege of being one of the centers here. JBI is an international research organization that they focus on not only providing evidence-based information, but also developing software to help us and facilitate evidence-based practice. They do education and training, not only in Adelaide, but throughout the country, throughout their collaborative centers. And the whole goal of what JBI is about, the why and the purpose is, is to improve healthcare outcomes. You've seen that the pebble, the round pebble, which you'll see throughout the presentation, is part of their uh, vision in that one pebble, one change can have a rippling effect and really transcend and transform healthcare throughout by having one actual intervention. So next slide. So JBI's vision, what they have a vision is really better evidence, better outcomes lead to a brighter future for everyone. And their mission is doing as much as they can in promoting and supporting evidence-based healthcare. JBI, typically describes herself as this bridge between practice, academia, and also uh, business world, bringing all of those together because JBI is a business entity also within itself. JBI is actually the center, the major center is in Adelaide, uh, Australia. And so as Dr. Mian had said, LSU is one of the collaborating centers. So next slide. So JBI's approach to evidence-based healthcare is really unique. It considers evidence-based healthcare as decision-making 
that not only looks at the problem, but when it comes looks at the problem and the solution, they really focus on feasibility, appropriateness, meaningfulness, and effectiveness, something that we know as FAME, F-A-M-E. The best available evidence has to be taken into consideration within the context of the care is delivered, also in considering the individual patient, and also bringing in professional judgment and expertise of all the healthcare professionals uh, in, to make the right decisions for the patient. It is a cyclical process, evidence-based practice is not just a straight linear process. And really when we're looking at evidence-based practice, we are trying to look at global healthcare needs and how as healthcare professionals, we can impact those global healthcare needs. So again, always remember, and you'll see that when I go over the JBI uh, model, that collaborate uh, in the collaborative part of the model and the interface, you'll see the feasibility, you'll see appropriateness, meaningfulness, and fame uh, represented there and, and effectiveness. Next slide. So here is the evidence-based practice model. So if you look in the middle is the pebble, and that is the core, really representing when we look at the FAME approach to our outcome. On the outer part of the uh, actual model here, you have the phases of which they consider to be evidence-based practice. You have evidence generation, evidence synthesis, evidence transfer, and then of course, evidence implementation, and that is all being done for global health. You will see the arrows here going in bi-directional, and that's because we think that it is not a linear process. It is pretty much circular. And as you gain more information, you may have to take a back step and uh, move back and forward within the evidence-based practice model here. You'll see on the outer skirts of their pictorial uh, model, when you look at evidence generation, evidence generation consists of research, expertise, and discourse. And when you look at evidence synthesis, it looks at systematic review, evidence summaries, and guidelines. And you can go on throughout the entire model. And hopefully you'll have this as a, a pictorial to keep with you. The overarching principles that uh, Professor Jordan has presented that really begins to set, set the context of evidence-based practice is culture, capacity, communication, and collaboration. And which gets to part of why we're doing a global is that we really believe everything it has to be done within a context. Next slide. So this is really a pictorial, again, of what we're trying to do. We have the research here, which is one part type of evidence, and we have practice. And really, JBI, they're, what they're really trying to do is close that gap through putting that ladder across there and really bridging that gap. Next slide. So pragmatic approach to implementation, JBI has an implementation model of which we actually here at LSU participate in conducting evidence implementation uh, training programs. And if you're interested in that, you can contact us. One of the things that you'll see that is very unique to JBI's model is what they call the evidence-based clinical audit and feedback. They really believe that you have to always do the audit and get that baseline information before you make some type of practice change and then come back and revisit that JBI audit. Those clinical audits are all based on evidence summaries that are developed by JBI. So they are already grounded in evidence base and the literature. So recognizing and understanding the role of professional culture, organizational support, and leadership in this process is really pivotal to really getting to the utilization and successful utilization. A JBI evidence implementation project is clinically oriented. It's a team-based initiative that really um, moves towards implementing the best available evidence that we have into the organization's culture, their systems, and their everyday practice and care. Here you have represented the seven phases of the specific JBI implementation model. These evidence-based implementation projects are quality improvement initiatives that are looking at utilizing a very similar approach to the PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle, with an emphasis on ensuring that there's clinical leadership to make sure that the uh, practice changes are implemented and they're also are sustained. So the JBI implementation approach is firmly grounded in the audit, feedback, re-audit process. It's a structured approach to not only the identification, but also the management of barriers to change and hopefully getting to the point of having sustainability. 
So you'll see the seven phases as identifying, engaging your, your clients, assessing the context and readiness for change. And that's where we begin to do the clinical audit, reviewing practice against the base best evidence that we have out there, implementing a change practice using GRIP, and GRIP is a program and an assessment tool, which is brings in the leadership dimension of making sure that we assess the barriers and the problems and begin to plan for making that plan change. And again, the reassessing the practice after we implement that change, that again, when you see in phase basically um, Three and four is really the clinical audit. And then in phase six, again, is really the, the re-auditing process. And then since phase seven is looking at sustainability. Our next slide. Next slide, Dr. Mia. So here, this picture just reminds you the globe here that we are having a widespread impact of the work with JBI. It is a worldwide initiative that's attributable to not only the local, but also global, global partnerships that ensure that activities are context driven by individuals and groups that understand their specific healthcare environment. Through its international network, JBI is well positioned to be a leader in producing, disseminating, and also providing a framework for the use of the best evidence that's out there into clinical decision-making and improving health outcome. Next. This gives you a represent, the next slide, please. Gives you a representation of the span of JBI. I talked about JBI, the, um, the main hub is in Adelaide, Australia, but these are all the collaborating entities of which you'll see the little dot there in New Orleans, Louisiana, that's us, the LSU here. There's 80 plus collaborating entities that come together through a network that not only uses the JBI model for evidence-based practice, but they use the JBI evidence implementation framework for implementing change, but they also have a standardized process of looking at comprehensive systematic reviews that really continues to build the evidence from the literature. And then they produce something called evidence summaries. And those evidence summaries are used not only in evidence-based practice, but also in evidence implementation project. So to be a part of this really global initiative is very impressive. And that is what JBI is. It's not one single entity. It's all of us together. Next slide. You hear the word JBI Oops. JBI collaboration. JBI is the largest global collaboration to integrate evidence-based healthcare within a theory-informed model that brings together both academic entities with hospitals and healthcare systems. The collaborating entities are all self-governing. So every center like LSU is a self-governing center, self-managed and self-operated. But everything is initiated and coordinated through the national, the, the international JBI center. We are driven by a united desire to contribute to improving the quality and outcomes of healthcare, not only locally, but globally through the delivery of high quality programs of evidence synthesis, transfer, and implementation. The functions of JBI are directed towards knowledge needs of local clinicians and consumers, within the collaborating entities leading to evidence-based initiatives within their region, country, state, and specifically very local institution. Next slide. So here we are today with GLOCAL, which we're calling uh, here in the GLOCAL solution room. So what is GLOCALization? Uh, before we begin, let's really focus on that. So GLOCAL solution room forms, comes from the whole term of GLOCALization. And globalization was popularized by the work of the sociologist uh, Roland Robertson, who traced its roots from the Japanese business term called Dakakuka, which emphasizes a global outlook that is adapted to local conditions. So you think globally, but you're acting locally. So globalization stresses the idea of contemporary globalization influencing the local level of society and the localization of globality. So going in both directions. So what we're gonna do is look at all these solution rooms across the country that are happening, the 35 plus that are going on, gonna go back into Adelaide JBI 
major center, and we're going to look at the commonality global. So the, the barriers and strategies that we talk about today will not only die here, I mean, not, not, they will not die here, they will be part of the international and global community. Next slide. So here's just another uh, picture to remind you of the JBI evidence model. I think we can move on to the next slide. So therefore, uh, thinking about the application of evidence context is really key to JBI. JBI is cognizant that it is our responsibility to not only provide healthcare professionals with the best evidence, but to support you in its use. Again, it's not possible without connecting in person, without acknowledging and accepting the different cultures and clinical environments that we work in and present different challenges in that, that we each have in our unique environment. And we hope that this event, event today contributes to overcoming some of the barriers to helping us all understand the challenges that we are facing in the multiple institutions, but also beginning to look at the commonality locally to move forward globally also. Next slide. So the a whole idea of the solution room came from a powerful conference session con that was a concept that was designed and developed during just really attendees getting together and discussing common problems. <laughs> While the JBI event doesn't strictly flow the follow the format of the original idea, the concept of being a solution focused and pragmatic was really attracted to JBI, and that's part of why we formed these local solution rooms. Pairing with real life challenges related to the implementation seemed an obvious choice and perfect opportunity for JBI and all of its collaborating entities across the globe to engage in what we seek to support and provide guidance for, and that is improving patient outcome and getting changes into practice. This is a learning to be achieved on both sides of the podium. It's an opportunity to share experiences and to co-create partnerships for the purpose of achieving better health outcomes by applying global knowledge to local challenges. We hope that everyone today enjoys our session and in finding solutions to our evidence-based practice challenges, not only globally, but locally. Next slide. And here are JBI, if you wanna to go to your fa favorite social media platform, you can just Google JBI and you'll be able to link in and connect with JBI through social media. So next slide, if you have any questions or want any further information on JBI, the larger uh, collaborating center, you can go to JBIC at uh, adelaide.edu.australia. And I think that concludes my presentation and introduction to what is just G local solution room. Thank you so very much, Dr. Porsche. So what we will hear now is from four dyads uh, that will talk about their barriers and challenges in implementing evidence-based practice. You'll hear from various types of hospitals here, inclusive of an academic medical center, two children's hospitals, in a nonprofit primary adult care institution. So our first dyad is from Arkansas Children's Hospital. It's Dr. Jamie Wiggins and Ms. Misty Cook. I'll tell you a little bit about our presenters and then I'll let them take it away. Dr. Jamie Wiggins serves as the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Arkansas Children. Jamie is steadfast in his commitment to improving quality of care and delivering excellence. Jamie oversees the patient care services and operations team and is ultimately responsible for developing, implementing, and improving the systems that deliver the best outcomes for the children of Arkansas. As a registered nurse, Jamie has clinical experience and operational expertise that informs a unique perspective focused on enhancing patient experience, growing programs, and promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Riggins serves as a core faculty in our Louisiana Center for Promotional of Optimal Health Outcomes, which is a JBI Center of Excellence here at LSU. Misty Cook is a master's prepared nurse who is board certified in pediatric nursing and pediatric hem hematology, oncology, nursing, and has 19 years of experience. She is the quality research nurse for the Cancer for Blood Disorder Service Lines at Arkansas Children's 
and she has worked with the team to decrease their central line associated bloodstream infection rates to the lowest it has been in eight years and improve the department's ranking with U.S. News and World Report. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wiggins and Ms. Misty Cook. Thanks, everybody. I think uh, I believe the first thing you do as an executive to support evidence-based practices, empower your teams and get out of the way. So to that credit, I am going to pass it over to Misty and let her talk about some of the great work we've done at Arkansas Children's. Thank you. I'm excited to be here today and it's an honor to be able to be a part of this. So as um, was stated, I am the quality research nurse for um, the cancer and blood disorder at Arkansas Children's Hospital. And since we're talking about barriers and strategies for implementing evidence-based practice at the bedside, I thought it would be helpful to show an example of a specific project we've been working on this past year, um, which is decreasing our CLABC um, infections and our CLABC rate and then discuss the barriers that we have faced and strategies um, that we use for implementing the evidence um, at the bedside. So just a little bit of background, as most of you know, the oncology patients, um, due to the longevity of their treatment, have central lines for an extended period of time. So you add this on with their compromised immune system, and they are um, definitely at an increased um, risk for CLABSIs. So this right here just shows a little bit of where our problem lies. So in FY22, you can see our CLABSIs um, more than doubled in um, going from an average of 6 to 14 which um, of course in turn um, significantly increased our CLABSI rate. So we definitely had a significant problem on our hand that we needed to, um, to face. So a few of the barriers that we um, came across when trying to implement evidence at the bedside was nurse turnover. So the past couple of years, as I'm sure most of you have endured we've had a significant issue with nurse turnover. Um, a lot of our nurses went to do tribal nursing. We had um, several tribal, tribal nurses come into our institution. And with that, you get deviation in practice. Um, engaging staff nurses. So the past couple of years, they've been in survival mode. They've been working short staff. They've been working um, overtime. They're precepting all the time. We had new nurses precepting other new nurses, and it's like a domino effect. If you have a deviation in practice and misinformation, then you're going to share that with your orientee, who's therefore going to share it with other nurses. We insufficient supplies, um, as most of you are probably getting as well, we get emails probably daily of supplies being back ordered or um, companies not making um, supplies that we use anymore. So we're having to find replacements. So getting that information out and teaching our staff how to use those supplies. Um, and then I've noticed in the past couple years that we have kind of turned into this punitive culture as opposed to patient safety culture. So when we're doing rounds and we're doing audits, the nurses have a fear of getting in trouble and being punished for it as opposed to just um, providing education for patient safety. So really turning that culture around was a barrier for us. And then lack of information and then knowledge about best practice. So like I said earlier, once you get a deviation in practice and misinformation, it just kind of um, goes to other nurses that they're precepting. So those were the barriers, some of the barriers that we faced. And so how did we overcome these barriers? Well, it's not really a rocket scientist idea. However, education was the big key. So I noticed getting the staff engaged was came down to the understanding of why. Why are we implementing these new practices? Um, when they're tired and they're taking care of 
um, more patients than they're used to because of short staff. You really have to get their buy-in of why this is important. Um, they, the frontline nurses are the ones implementing this practice as we are just giving them the tools to do it. So if we don't have their buy-in, then the, um, it won't be a successful implementation in the end. So education, really honing in on why it's important to use one agent over the other, why it's important um, to make sure the patients are getting their hygiene, why documentation is so important. So we really focused in on that, kind of went back to the basics, make sure our nurses understood why we were doing this, and then getting them engaged. Communication was key for that. They wanted to know where we were with our infection rates, how many infections we have had over the past couple months. So really keeping them informed on where we were, what's, what new supplies that were coming out, um, if supplies were back ordered. I would send out mid-monthly reminders to our auditors, reminding them to do those audits. Um, and that really helped them. They get busy with their task that they have to do in their shifts. So just having those quick reminders to do the audits really helped um, them increase our audits. And then changing the culture. And as we all know, this is not easy. So I didn't want our nurses to feel that they were getting punished every time we would come and do audits or round on patients with central lines. So we started with our unit-based council. So it's a group of staff members that meet monthly and just kind of go over issues and how we can make them better for our unit. So I started with them and explained the issue and how we were being, you know, it was getting across to us that they felt like they were getting in trouble every time we put out new education. So we wanted our core leader nurses to really go out and explain why we were doing this. Um, if they heard negative talk about, um, well, I got in trouble for this, then really try to explain that it's not getting in trouble. We're just making sure the patients are safe. So, and then our last slide just shows um, the success of us overcoming the barriers and um, being able to use the strategies to get evidence implemented at the bedside. And with that, I will turn it over to questions. Actually, we're going to save questions for the end of the presentation. Okay. And with that, we're going to turn it over to our next dyad. Uh, we've already introduced Dr. Porsche, so let me tell you a little about a, a bit about his co-presenter, Dr. Heather Brooks. Dr. Heather Brooks is a board-certified family nurse practitioner with the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners since 2012. Dr. Brooks joined the University Medical Center in 2019 and partners with the organization's trauma services in the care of hospitalized older adults. She co-chairs the University Medical Center Nursing Research Evidence-Based Practice Council and serves as the site coordinator for the Nurses Improving Care for Health System Elders Program. Dr. Porsche and Dr. Brooks. Thanks, Dr. Miyad. I think I'll begin and um, Ms. Dr. Brooks will jump in at the end. Uh, so first, next slide. So as we begin, I just want to give you a little context of University Medical Center. University Medical Center is part of the LCMC a system of hospitals. The um, When we really began this initiative, we were dealing with an organization that was in early phases of development, but also had transitioned from what was the remnants of the old charity hospital system in New Orleans. So you had a different population of staff that moved from one previous institution to the other. So we had a mixture of that, and then we had a mixture of new employees. And then we had an organization that was just beginning to have a new uh, practice model and also a new shared governance model, of which one of the councils was the Evidence-Based Practice and Research Council that was developed. 
So the immediate first thing we did was actually develop the shared governance structure and then begin to develop the organizational structure of the evidence-based practice research council. And when we began to really begin our initiatives, um, we were having at that time the primarily activities that were going on was beginning of the DNP projects. And a lot of those DNP projects was coming to the early, early research council and evidence-based practice council was mainly dealing with them. So what we found is some of the barriers when we were really beginning to look at pushing out evidence-based practice and getting more research going was limited access to nurses who actually had the background and knowledge and, and, and uh, credentials in evidence-based practice and research. Because remember, this was early, the DNP was just beginning, so we did not have a lot of DNP prepared staff or not, not a lot of PhD prepared or DNS prepared individuals within the hospital. The other thing that we ran into was the creating the culture to ensure that the nurses on the front line had the appropriate amount of time and the allocation of time to implement evidence-based practice and research and begin to really change that management culture to change the dialogue that was happening in meetings to bring forth not only problems, but also evidence-based practice initiatives. We also found like Arkansas Children's Hospital that there was a lack of knowledge about evidence-based practice and research. And that goes, I think, with the limited access to nurses who were really credentialed in evidence-based practice and research. Also a lack of knowledge about disseminating uh, information. And once they have, you know, let's say complete an evidence-based practice project or QI project in their institution, uh, so we actually found that there was hardly any publishing going on within the institution, very little presentations going on within the institution. Now, there were pockets of that activity happening, but not throughout the organization. And it really wasn't a, a big focus within nursing. And then we also ran through the, the idea of confusion about what is research, what is quality improvement, what is evidence-based practice? Where is the commonality, the overlap, but also where is the differentiation? And so that led to some confusion as we were trying to roll out not only quality improvement within the different councils of the uh, shared governance model, but also making sure that everything was evidence-based and also at the same time trying to get research initiated, initiated in the institution. Heather, I'll stop here before we move on to strategies and see if you'd like to add anything. Oh, thank you. You did a great job. I just wanted to add that uh, the staffing challenges here, such as um, turnover, high utilization of short term and contract staff, that limits our ability to build relations with clinical nurses and educate them on evidence based practice and research processes. And also, I do feel I agree, and I've seen it here, that there is some confusion as far as the delineation of evidence based practice, research, and quality improvement. And I've noticed um, that a lot of the language for research and jargon used for research is also used to describe evidence-based practice and QI and vice versa. So it seems to muddy the waters a little bit uh, when trying to characterize each of the three. Thanks. And I think we're next we'll move on to our strategies. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, something like this, it is, I think, as we shared with Arkansas, um, the same challenge. It, it's about creating a culture shift and culture change within the organization. And this doesn't happen overnight. So it is really a multi-implementation of an inter of organizational interventions to really begin this work. And I think we're not there. We're all, all of us are, are probably on the journey. So some of the things that we did, did was develop champions within the mm -hmm. hospital. Uh, for engagement of clinical nurses on research projects and really tried to not only get the champions throughout the hospital, but get nurse managers more involved. Having the nurse managers identify individuals who may be interested in the research council. And so not only is it now, you know, the research council, but you have one layer of your management team involved mm -hmm. and attuned to what's going on and even beginning to talk about QI 
and evidence based uh, practice in their actual management meetings. And, and I think there's been a lot of uh, progress there. Conducting presentation on evidence based practice and research. And this is something that has to continually go on. It happens also in with the Lantern program at UMC, which is the nurse residency program um, within University Medical Center. But really begin there differentiating research from evidence-based practice and how both research and evidence base is used to for quality improvement and making those distinctions. But also we developed a uh, seminar series for all nurses, opened it up to the entire hospital on different aspects of evidence-based practice, also aspects of research. We also have a, a local Sigma Theta Tar organization, Epsilon Nu, that now has moved from being just an Epsilon new chapter at LSU to be an Epsilon new chapter at large, that it brings in University Medical Center as part of that chapter. And also with that comes an annual research day where you not only have nursing research, but also nursing scholarship. And from the scholarship piece, we can bring in evidence-based practice projects, maybe quality improvement initiatives, et cetera. Also looking at the issue of not disseminating, LSU has a writing retreat that we do. Uh, and so we invited and actually had several of our partner uh, hospitals send individuals to the writing retreat. But we also had some focus educational program on how to write an abstract so that those practicing nurses that may have a QI project or whatever they're writing about, something that's going on in the hospital, that they could submit an abstract and then hopefully that would be accepted and lead to uh, professional presentations at their professional organizations. And then we developed a really formal academic practice partnership where we have actually one of our faculty who serves as a nursing research consultant um, to the University Medical Center and also sits on the Evidence-Based Practice and Research Council. And then lots of organizational resources that Heather is still putting together and making happen. Contract with a statistician. I think the nurse researcher is one of the organizational resources. And also the development of a C grant where the nurse practicing frontline nurses, any, any of the nursing staff for that matter, can apply and submit a proposal and get some seed funding. Heather, what else would you like to add to strategies? Again, you did an excellent job um, as far just to stress the importance of a culture shift and that getting in front of the leaders to have them identify champions has been successful so far. And we've had eight nurses since then um, become involved with projects. And also the academic partnership has been very helpful with low barrier access to our nurse researcher consultant at LSU Health. Great. Thank you. So next up is East Jefferson General Hospital, and we're here from Dr. Jennifer Manning and Mr. Lane Mistretta. Let me tell you a little bit about this dyad. Dr. Jennifer Manning is the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Nursing Programs here at LSU. Over her span of her 23-year nursing career, she practiced in both adult and critical care settings. She serves as the clinical nurse researcher at the LCMC Health East Jefferson General Hospital. Dr. Manning is the president-elect to the National Association of Clinical Nurse Specialists, and she was appointed to the Louisiana State Board of Nursing in 2018 and currently serving in her second four-year term. Mr. Lane Mistretta is the Corporate Senior Director of Education and Professional Development for LCMC Health. Most recently, he was the Director of Education at East Jefferson General Hospital. He has been in nursing for the past 31 years and with a clinical background in emergency nursing. He's board certified in nursing professional development and currently enrolled in the Executive Nurse Leader BNP program. Lane engages in evidence-based practice processes within the nine hospitals of the LCMC health system. And he has built uh, into the CCNE accredited nurse residency program. Dr. Manning and Mr. Mistretta. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, I wanna echo the things that the previous speakers, Dr. Porsche and Misty from the other organizations, it's ditto on all the challenges and uh, the barriers and strategies to accomplish what we need to, to embed the 
culture of evidence-based practice within the organization. Also, the four principles Dr. Porsche referred to early in the initial presentation about the culture capacity, collaboration and communication is, is truly key on the foundation principles on how to, but it's a constant how to um, on backwards and forwards and going and coming. And it's, it's, you may get the culture there, but then the communication about the culture may not be present. So you have to focus in on those strategies and the collaborative events that I know other speakers are gonna say um, in the next presentations about how we do the academic practice partnerships. And all of those things are awesome ideas and ways to get this done. So some of our more frequent and long-term barriers to um, success and, and to implementation of the EBP projects over the past, I guess, 15 or so years, East Jefferson is one of the first magnet organizations within the state. And we had to embed something with evidence-based practice and research and some type of clinical inquiry into our entire process. So yes, it was developed. But as Misty stated earlier from Arkansas, turnover happens. And the people with the knowledge of that entire entity of EBP or research may have gone and they left with some of that knowledge. So we're constantly starting and re redirecting, reforming um, about how to stabilize that entity of culture of EBP. Our most recent um, efforts for our residency program Dr. Porce re referred to the Lantern Program, which is an accredited residency program for new first year uh, graduates, is across the nine hospital system, um, which is an amazing start to get them interested about what they can do to impact the outcomes, the quality outcomes, and how they can start. And where to start is a big issue. Um, but Dr. Manning will express how to align those questions about where to start with the organizational goals. Um, low comfort and confidence level um, of the staff regarding EBP. Many of our graduates do come from the baccalaureate prepared programs and they get a, a taste of that in their research courses. Um, but it's a guided research course and you have that um, formation of support that's at the bedside, I mean, at the, in the classroom setting. Um, I know they're challenged in several of the programs to look outside the box and work with the, um, the clinical partners. But when you have that person who is at the bedside now and the confidence level from having the, the partnership of the instructor may not be there, it's just understanding how we can provide that comfort or that support that they need to move to the next levels. Um, it's not always present. We know it may be there, but to demonstrate that to them that they are, they have somebody here and we have someone identified as your support, your mentor, your peer, your coach for that. Um, not knowing how to um, perform the clinical inquiry. Some of the new graduates that we get are from the baccalaureate, but a large percentage may not be from the associates programs that may have not have had to do the clinical inquiry or research or look through CINAHL and trying to navigate those types of nuances that you may need to when performing um, a, a literature review. So having those opportunities to teach them and have the classes for them. Uh, time constraints, even with our, our most experienced nurse, um, nurses in the organization who want to perform EDP, projects and improve the quality of the organization, having the time to fulfill that need and um, the time it takes to do something well. You may get started, but having those people like Dr. Manning, who's our clinical researcher, to constantly be on edge with them saying, hey, remember this project that you started, or having those people that can push you and remind you and, and, and motivate you to see the end product to fruition. Um, not knowing about the available support and mentorship is probably one of the key things. The communication component on the key principles of JBI, I think, is a, a very important component about letting them know what's there and available to them and how to perform these things. And then the lack of structure of support. It all goes together with the uh, collaborative uh, efforts, the capacity of the organization, and the leadership support behind it. So those are the things that are most current and most 
frequent and ongoing barriers to success. And I think it's um, a constant challenge as we address those. So next slide. Thanks, Lane. So I um, wanna begin by thanking everyone. I'm happy to be here today and talk about my role and the strategies in my role as the clinical researcher at East Jefferson. And it builds upon the barriers that were just mentioned. So the first is promoting and marketing a culture of research and evidence-based practice. It's important that you have opportunities for staff to encounter the the culture of promoting research in various ways, whether it be through meetings on the website, which is access to resources or meeting them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it's important for us to meet them where they are and because it generally all starts with a clinical question. And so that is something that I strive to do when working with them because if, if you kind of just in your office, it's, it's just not going to work. You have to go to them when those clinical questions are coming up. And I do work with the residents, but I also work with staff nurses. So they're not always gathered. They're going to be on their units working. And that's where you may have to meet them. Promoting education and and support to staff who are interested is also important because these terms and the practice and the process of conducting research in EBP it's just not something they're thinking about every day and they do need to have something like a toolkit and that's what we use um, that they can work through and you can hand to them and it's very user friendly and they work through it step by step as they're navigating through the process and then being available to them as they have questions is key. Dedicating time and personnel to champion. I work tirelessly to find others who will connect and collaborate with me, but also making sure that I dedicate the time that I need to connecting with them is, a, is an important strategy. Assisting and aligning the EBP with the organization's quality or performance measures, that is comes kind of somewhat easily, um, but you do have to make sure that when they identify that clinical question, you're always pointing them back to what is already known, what is already being done, what is the policy, um, is someone already working on this? And these are things that are not always aware in their awareness. And so I do work to try to ask a lot of those questions so that they can work through. And then a lot of times when they pull that policy, it emerges that maybe simply we're just not following the policy. And then we have to work through another strategy to improve evidence-based practice, or it needs to be updated. Mentoring and coaching is primarily a lot of what I do, and um, you know, giving them that confidence, giving them that support that they need to develop things like PICO questions, or publishing, or even encourage them to go further and apply for a small grant. Um, these are goals that we set, and when you mention it to them, um, something like publishing or applying for a grant, their eyes get wide and they think about, well, I'm not sure if I'm familiar at all with doing that. But once we start breaking it down into little steps, then they kind of walk through it. Even presenting has become a challenge for some. That was their biggest hurdle because public speaking was an area where they were most concerned, not so much reading the literature. And then lastly, demonstrating successes through summary reporting. It's really important to make sure that they present at East Jefferson. We do let them, they do uh, present at the medical grand rounds. That's a huge asset to that organization because it does allow that information to get to the physicians who are always interested in those projects and really enlightened by the great work that they're doing. So that concludes for me. Thank you. Next slide. And last, but certainly not least, we have Children's Hospital of New Orleans. We have Dr. Benita Chapman and Ms. Elaine of the Dream. Dr. Benita Chapman is the Assistant Dean for Clinical Nursing Education and is an Assistant Professor of Clinical Nursing here at LSU School of Nursing. She also holds an appointment as the Nurse Researcher at Children's Hospital here in New Orleans and also an appointment to the LSU School of Graduate Studies. Dr. Chapman is a certified nurse educator and certified as an adult and youth and also psychological first aid, mental health uh, first aid instructor. Elena Vadreen has 20 years of pediatric experience at Children's Hospital in here in New Orleans. Since 2018, she has served as the Director of Nursing Professional Development, overseeing all aspects of nursing education and nursing professional development. In 2022, she acquired the oversight of the hospital's magnet program. 
Elena also serves as co-chair of the hospital's evidence-based practice and research committee. She also assisted in creating the hospital's first evidence-based practice fellowship program designed to provide evidence-based practice education, guidance, and mentorship for all clinical staff. Dr. Chapman and Mr. Dream. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayette. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having us today. What we're gonna talk about is, you're gonna hear um, some of the very same things that you just heard. Um, there's some similar themes there, as it seems that we all um, have the same barriers uh, to creating that EVP culture. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about how we established our partnership and how we came to have the nurse researcher to help support us. And we'll go through some of our barriers and strategies that we have used for success. Next slide, please. So first at Children's Hospital, we had, um, we had a vision and we had a commitment that we wanted better outcomes from our patients, families, and staff. We wanted that to come from the bedside nurses. We wanted that to come from the clinical nurses. And we were also very early on in our magnet journey. And when we did that gap analysis, we realized that creating an evidence-based culture, evidence-based practice, nursing research was a gap that we had. And so how could we bridge that gap so that we could do um, have better patient outcomes for our patients and achieve the magnet status, uh, the nursing research requirements that we needed to? And so what was our steps going to be to create an evidence-based uh, practice and research culture at the hospital? Our nursing leadership, we formed a partnership with LSU, and we created our first evidence-based practice and research council and committee. And I um, was very um, happy to be a part of that initiation and, and am still active on it as the co-chair. And the partnership with LSU was really pivotal because um, Dr. Chapman was on it as well as um, a couple of other LSU faculty. And they really helped us as a, a committee understand and give us some of that education that we also needed as ourselves. Um, because the committee members, for some of us, we were also what's, ev what's evidence-based, what's quality improvement, what's research. So we had to kind of learn all of that ourselves. And so what we actually decided to do was we did, the committee did an evidence-based practice project on what are the best practices to enculturate evidence-based practice into an organization. So we learned the steps of EBP as we were doing our project so that we could figure out what is the best way to do to enculturate this into our organization. And within the literature, what we found was that a lot of the recommendations was a partnership with an academic um, organization so that you can have those resources, that expertise, because we lacked that. That was a gap for us. And so that's part of where that partnership, that's where that partnership started. And then as we went along, we realized we need, we need more help with nursing research. We need to understand how to do it. We need a mentor. We need somebody to guide us through nurses through that process so that we can create that environment that is supportive of nursing research. And so we, again, partnered with our, with, um, our academic partner, and we were able to secure a PRN nurse researcher. Um, and with that, I will introduce you to her, Dr. Chapman. <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you, Elena. Um, so it was really about having that shared vision. And Elena explained to y'all that before there even was a thought about the need for the nurse researcher, um, we were really trying to collaborate. Um, they collaborated with us at LSU really because they were trying to start out the culture and create this culture of evidence-based practice. I remember us sitting in meetings three to four hours trying to sort all of this out. And in my mind, I was like, oh gosh, we're going to do this every week or every month. <laughs> Um, but it was a commitment. It was a shared vision. And we realized that at the end of the day, um, we can't work in silos anymore. 
the academic institution and the clinical agency would have to collaborate in order for us to not only move forward in what we're doing from the academic standpoint, but also move forward in order to create better patient care and outcomes for the patients that we take care of. So I came in as a consultant and honestly, I didn't know where I was going to go. Like I knew that part of that was really helping to create this culture of evidence-based practice and research and also helping when it came to the um, actual council and really making sure that we had structured ways and processes of doing things. But I didn't know what that would look like. Um, I didn't know where that would end and what that would look like when it comes to how I would institute my role as a nurse researcher. But what my role has actually developed into is really more of a mentor. Um, I'm there to really to support. We start from the beginning. We start from the idea to the end when we think about dissemination and that's publication. So it's, it's all, I'm throughout that whole journey of when we talk about culture change, we wanted to make sure that evidence-based practice as well as research wasn't just something that an idea. We really wanted to create an experience and to provide nurses the opportunity to feel like it was something reachable. And part of being reachable is meaning that we were giving them the tools needed in order to reach those things. And so without going into um, more detail or further detail about some of our strategies, we'll go next into another slide um, to really talk about our barriers. So, Elena, is this, this one, I think it's you. No, this one's you. It's me. Great. So part of some of the barriers that um, not only myself, but even Elena saw is that one of the things was we were starting all of this around COVID. So staffing was a critical issue because not only did we have our um, bedside nurses not being available, but even our administrators were now even having to go in and help with staffing. So that was a big issue when you're trying to change culture and get people to be more adapt to realizing that um, not only is evidence-based practice something that we do, but it's who we are. Um, there are people that just lack interest. It, I mean, it just wasn't their thing. That thing was just like, I'm just going to focus on bedside. So how do we get, how do we get nurses to realize that part of this journey is being equipped with these skills to realize that in order for us to have better patient outcomes, we have to institute evidence-based practice into the work that we do. And then there wasn't enough information. So some nurses didn't feel like they were equipped. They didn't feel like they had what they needed in order to be able to not only institute evidence-based practice, but even think about the thought of being or doing research. In fact, some of them would say, I haven't even been to school in so many years. I don't even know where to start with this. And the thought of even thinking about evidence-based practice or research was something that they didn't even think was touchable. So what we knew is that we needed some external resources. And that's really where the academic pra um, practice partnership really helped because we needed a statistician. We needed the ability to have various um, databases that could be used beyond, beyond what we had from the hospital standpoint. And we also need access to get some of those city trainings done that you need in order to, you, for you to even go through IRB. And even those simple things that we don't even think about, you know, as far as providing the resources that nurses need in order to really be able to, be, to participate in evidence-based practice fully, um, as well as research, um, we realized that there were some resources that they didn't have at the hospital that the school um, was able to provide. Elena? Next slide, please. So for some of our strategies, um, we, were a, we were able to um, publish three articles with the help of um, Dr. Chapman, and we've done four research studies. We really reconstructed our EVP committee. It used to be part of the shared governance, and we restructured um, that because if you know how shared governance works, it's supposed to turn over staff. Um, yearly, and we need expertise there. So we took that out and made it its own hospital committee so that we would have longevity in our committee members, and they would be the true experts in, um, in, in the organization. Also, our EVP committee is interprofessional, so it's not just nursing. We have child life involved. Um, we have our quality analysts involved who are not nurses, so it's, it, it's multidisciplinary there. We really kind of developed some streamlined processes and in the fact that we had project, we had DMP projects going 
going everywhere. And we didn't know, there was nobody, nobody knew who was doing what. There was no formal approval process. And so um, we really worked to streamline that process and to communicate with our academic partners that you have to go through this approval process for a DMP project. Um, and if you were an imp- if you were a staff member and you were clinical and you wanted to do a project, you needed to reach out to the Evidence Based Practice and Research Council to get approval. Because to Dr. Manning's point, you don't want people doing multiple projects and doing the exact same thing. Um, so we wanted, and we wanted to make sure that it was aligned with our goals and the quality metrics that um, that the unit was was looking at. So we kind of streamlined some of those processes. Um, what I'm really most proud of is our EBP fellowship. So when we were doing our literature review on best practices for enculturation of EBP, what we kept hearing over and what we kept seeing over and over in the literature is mentorship, mentorship. They need mentorship, mentorship. So we said, well, let's develop a fellowship program for them. Um, and so it has evolved from a 12 month. It is now a 15 month program because with feedback, they nurses didn't have enough time. Staffing is a challenge. We all have that challenge and they needed more time for implementation. And so it is a, um, so once a month and it's not every month, but once a month they have education with our EDP council and they come with the project in mind. We give them the start of the education, how to develop a PQ question. We work with them to develop that PQ question. They're assigned a mentor, someone who's on the, the council. And that mentor meets with them on months that we don't meet um, because they go through the whole process, how to search the literature, how to appraise the, the literature, how to devise your plan, your implementation plan, who are your stakeholders? How are you going to decide who needs to be your stakeholders? So that fellowship program goes through them all the way and then they disseminate it. Um, We have an internal dissemination symposium that we do. And then we encourage them to disseminate it externally. And um, we have had, we are on our fourth cohort And within three cohorts, we've had 32 people go through it, some of them in teams, some of them singly. And uh, we have had two publications and one about to be published. And those were those were from our fellows. We have had about five or six of our fellows who have gone on to do either podium or poster presentations for national conferences like Society of Pediatric Nurses. Um, so we're really excited about that that program. That is a big strategy that we um, continue to to want to build and build that process. And through that EBP fellowship program, we have even identified some things that are like, you know what, this really should go more the research route because they were having trouble finding evidence. And so now we are bringing those people in to say, okay, this really needs some re- research and not EBP. Um, so. That is one of our biggest strategies that I think is working. We're still a work in progress. We still have staffing challenges like everybody else. You still have some lack of engagement. But when you do have those nurses that are engaged and they find out that they have the support of the fellowship program, their willingness to jump in it and realize, okay, I'm not alone in this. I have a mentor who's going to work with me. I'm getting the education because I don't really know where to start. It makes it a lot more easier for them to engage in. Anything else you would like to add, Dr. Chapman? No, I totally agree. I just think, I think one of the things like yesterday, we had a um, um, how to create an abstract workshop for our staff nurses and administrators to be able to come and attend. And even that was a conduit for us to also be able to prompt them and say, if there are other needs that you have and other topics that we can be able to provide you all in order to, again, create a sense of achievability that they can achieve these things that, you know, sometimes doesn't feel like you can if you haven't been in school in forever. Um, But one of the things we wanted to make sure is that we were continuing to create resources for them to have the skills that they need in order to meet some of their goals. I think that's it for us. Thank you. Thank you to all of our dyads um, that have presented today. 
We're going to bring back Dr. Demetrius Porsche to kind of sum up our common themes of those barriers and strategies that you've heard. Dr. Porsche. Thanks, Dr. Mietta. I had to get myself off of mute there. So I think we heard some very similar uh, barriers and strategies, but also some very interesting and differentiating uh, things that uh, each institution locally within their hospital context is uh, dealing with. Definitely staffing and turnover is something that I heard, but I also heard things like engagement, supplies. But one of the biggest things that I think overarching thing that I heard is education and culture. And when the education piece, I think I'm taking a little ownership here in that it sounds like if the nurses are not understanding the difference between research, quality improvement, and what is evidence-based practice and how it can be used across different things, that the academic environment is not doing a good enough job with the competency there of making sure that our students are coming out practice ready to know the differentiation from that. So that is a, a learning lesson for us in academia. I also heard through that knowledge, lack of knowledge. And I think I also heard a little bit of intimidation, fear and stuff that nurses, but that again may be rooted in knowledge. Uh, and, and some of that could be coming in from the fact that they're not ready for implementing pr uh, practice changes uh, as they're coming out of their academic institution. I also heard structure, I heard support, you know, with the culture, you know, how they say that strategy can eat, a culture can eat strategy any day, but you need to have the actual structure that was put in place. I think the evidence-based practice fellowship was phenomenal, can be a model that you have at your local institution that could be implemented you know, in multiple institutions. And again, that is talking to not only structure, but it's creating a culture. I um, also want to praise Children's Hospital from the fact of beginning with that vision. And I think we may not have articulated, but I think that was happening and probably not so much in those words at University Medical Center also, starting with that common vision. So having that vision was there. Um, and I think uh, I just keep kept writing education, interest, and and knowledge uh, is is some of the the big challenges that I've seen. Or I think I heard as barriers, and I'll open it up to others to say. Another strategies I think what I heard on the opposite side of the the, of the barriers is setting that vision and that culture in place, putting the structure in place providing the resources, whatever those resources are, whether they're educational, forming an academic practice partnership, getting uh, academia in there, bridging that gap, developing your own internal processes of educating your own individuals through a residency, through a fellowship program. That is definitely a known strategy. But also another thing I, I, I like what I heard about the why. Uh, and I think that came from Children's Arkansas. It's, it's okay to provide the education, but that why is very important uh, so that they understand the background as to why we're doing this. And it's what JBI is about, improving outcomes is why we're doing this. I think uh, also uh, Children's Hospital in New Orleans also mentioned that is wanting to improve their outcomes. Um, again, culture, culture, culture. I also like the fact that the mentoring was brought up. Um, and I think we can't get around the issues of we are a practice discipline. And with the practice discipline, one of the huge barriers and the strategies we have to figure out is the time, the staffing issue that is pretty came out pretty predominant to me. Um, the other strategies that I, I think uh, I heard is really documenting your success. I think we heard indirectly through some of the presentation, things that have been achieved, making sure that you have those outcomes documented and you know what is success and where you are as, you, uh, as you're on this journey and trying to achieve, which means that we should all be setting goals and having some pretty big, uh, high aspirational goals. How many articles we wanna publish? How many research projects we want going on? How many uh, evidence-based practice, quality improvement projects we want going on in the institution? How many you know presentations we want going on? And really begin to hold that up. But then also looking across the organization, not only how many presentations you're doing, publications, et cetera, but who are the individuals doing these? And you really begin to, um, to really see how well you're permeating the culture within the organization. Because when you now have frontline nurses that are talking the language and doing the presentations and talking about submitting abstracts, that's pretty phenomenal. 
um, and, and not really afraid of that R word, which is research. The other thing too is um, I think what we've seen in transition, uh, and this wasn't directly said, but I, I know it because I know a lot of the institution, we're seeing an increase in the DNP graduates and a number of the DNP individuals in the hospital. So that is helping. But we're also seeing some institutions really uh, pushing the number of PhD prepared nurse researchers in their institution, uh, you know, and, and not every PhD is the same. So you need a PhD that's really geared towards nursing science and nursing research. And, and, um, and I'm not trying to say one is better than the other, but I think when we're looking at clinical practice, we need those re PhDs in nursing that are focusing on clinical. How can we make clinical change? I think PhDs and, uh, you know, nurses can have a PhD in psychology and do just as well if they're working in behavioral health, mental health. So I'm not limiting it just to that, but having that really strong research PhD, I think is gonna set a long-term culture along with those DNPs. I think the challenge we're gonna have and the challenge for uh, starts with us in academia is now how do we get those two working together collaboratively? And I think Elena uh, also talked about that. You know, We saw this evidence-based practice called QI, whatever you were saying, and we really figured, oh, this is, this is not there for evidence-based quality. This needs to go on to research. And that's why you need the DNPs and the PhDs working together collaboratively within the institution, but we're all about the patient outcomes. So that's kind of my summary, but I would like to open it up if Dr. Miet, if you're willing to see what other people heard, because I'm only one, one individual. Absolutely, we have a few minutes for that, but I also want to leave time for questions and answers. Uh, and for you all in our audience to tap the expertise of our wonderful panel we have here with us today. So we'll open it up. Feel free to um, unmute and uh, provide any input that you'd like to. Anybody else? Anybody heard anything that I didn't hear? <laughs> Certainly, Dr. Porsche didn't hear it all. Thank you. I did not. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, we're going to open it up um, for our audience. The purpose of this uh, global solution room is for you to have the opportunity to ask your questions about uh, barriers and strategies that you may be experiencing in implementing evidence-based practice. And so with that, we're gonna open it up for any questions that anyone may have or additionally any comments. You can feel free to use the chat function if you're shy and don't want to unmute. Or you can certainly monitor the chat box as well. I just want to um, stress of the importance of the entire process is contingent upon the academic practice, clinical practice partnerships, that without having the academic piece to partner with the clinical piece. We have the practice challenges, we have the bedside nurse at hand, but it's how do we form them correctly? We can train, we can educate on our perspectives as far as for maybe the, the, the practice, clinical practice doctorate, but having the academic PhD, like you said, the nursing science component of it, Dr. Porsche, it was so important to be able to have that whether it's a quality improvement or EVP or a research project, like Elena was, you know, got to the end of the day and it was, oh, this is research. Well, having that upfront is, it's so important to have that fluid dialogue, the ability to reach across the aisle and say, hey, I'm having a challenge with this. Do you think you can give me some pointers or even come over or let's demonstrate to our team that we are one as far as for academia and clinical practice. Like it doesn't end when you get your degree. I saw it. It's a constant mm -hmm. process. So thank you. One thing I would add and tagging onto what uh, Lane said is, is challenge, it really is not a comment. It's really a challenge to everyone. 
when you're doing your uh, quality improvement projects, uh, you're probably looking a little bit of this, but every research project and every everything that you're doing, whether it's, uh, you know, you're using a evidence-based project practice uh, initiative to, you know, improve your outcome, you need to have a fiscal uh, assessment component and really begin to look at the fiscal impact of what you're doing, whether it's research or not, because we live, um, and I know nurses who tend to shy away from this, but we, you know, healthcare is a business and we have to be able to demonstrate how nursing practice and, shine, and science is really can have a positive fiscal impact on uh, the bottom line within the healthcare institutions and how really we're not only improving outcomes, but those outcomes are measured in, in financial savings possibly. So I think we need to, to think about that fiscal component uh, for everything we're doing. Um, I have a question. Um, at, at LSU, when I was there uh, as a faculty member, we were um, uh, prescient enough to start our own gerontology uh, nursing course. And the foundation of that course was based on research that was done by the Hartford Foundation with the GNEC consortium of five uh, major hospital systems, uh, nursing and nursing uh, services in those systems, um, and developed hundreds of assessment tools of different levels for the older adult patient. Um, we thought we did a great job of incorporating as many of those tools, teaching them to our students in many different courses, not just the gerontology course, but across courses and assign courses, um, certain courses, those tools to use in the clinical practice. Um, I was trying, I'm trying to understand, would JBI then have taking, taken those findings um, and we were trying to implement through the back door, you know, through our students going into clinical situations. But would JBI have integrated that with East Jefferson, with, um, well, not children's because these were, uh, you know, gerontology assessment tools. Um, would East Jefferson say, um, or University Hospital, um, I know I worked at the VA um, as, as part of uh, volunteering after retirement, and they knew nothing about these J, uh, these Hartford GNEC uh, research evidence based uh, research um, for validity and and reliability tools, but they were not implementing as them as evidence based practice at the VA. So I'm wondering, what's the role of JBI? Do they know about these things? Is that part of what they do is they disseminate these inf this information? Um, it wouldn't be original new research, but it would be a quality improvement program and perhaps uh, the dissemination of existing evidence-based practice and how did, say, East Jefferson um, a, was able to incorporate what we were sending new students out with these tools and was it able to be picked up in the clinical um, setting. I, I can try. I think I can try to an, uh, answer that. It's great seeing you, Marge. I uh, hope you're doing well. Um, so, um, so JDI and and the National Hartford is is still two separate entities, and we are we still maintain a membership. And actually, I am co-chairing their their national conference uh, this year for the geriatric. And so that is still, they, they still have all those tools and all those educational, so they still have that there. What JBI does, they work separately, um, but they would, what they would do is promote comprehensive systematic reviews. And some of those comprehensive systematic reviews could be looking at the research on some of those geriatric tools and looking at synthesizing the evidence so that it then gets translated or transferred into practice. So that is what JBI would do, but they, they work in their own world of entity. And so all the work through JBI is not really coordinated 
globally, it's happening at the individual centers and entities. So if you would have a center or an entity that is focusing on geriatrics, they would be producing a lot of that work in the area of geriatrics or in multiple different areas. And with that, um, JBI also produces what's called evidence summaries. And these evidence summaries are already evidence-based. You can pull out and say, okay, how do we prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia? And if they have an evidence summary on there, it's going to already synthesize for you the latest evidence on these are the interventions that you can possibly do individually or bundled together into a nursing intervention to decrease uh, those infections. Uh, so that's how JBI works, but you still have, the heart rate is still going on. They're still, you know, it's a different structure, different financial model. They don't have all the funding, as you uh, mentioned previously from the Hartford Institution, but they're still managing and still trying to have an annual conference and produce educational materials and some clinical tools are dealing with geriatrics. So I hope I answered Thank you. Thank you. So LSU is still involved in both worlds. Good. Any other questions? Yeah, um, this is Susan Cook. Um, I'm an LSU clinical nursing instructor, and I just maybe a comment. Um, I, as an ICU manager for a lot of my career, uh, I implemented a lot of the bundles, you know, because it was quality and it was pay for per, for performance. And the two things that I want to stress on any project where you're trying to change practice is interdisciplinary because we would have never have had the success without our intensivists and our respiratory therapists and our even our environmental services because they want to learn and be part of the solution too. And the second thing was um, accountability. And I think what we see now with the drastic reduction in CLABSI and CAUTI and VAP is that everyone is accountable. So when I watch the intensivists do their rounds at, at my clinical site, they're going through all of the bundle elements every single day for every single patient. And they're posting the results up on a screen on how many days since a fall or how many days since a collapse. So I think that keeping it forefront will, will make it, will have longevity and also the change that we need to see. But I can't stress enough, all of my shared governance teams had representation from all the interdisciplinary groups. Thank you, Susan. Any other questions? We have a few more minutes left. Any other questions or comments? Not hearing any trusting panel. We uh, do have some comments in the chat talking about great work. And I really love hearing from each of our dyads about the work that's being done. Dr. Telly also put a great comment into the uh, chat talking about it's very applicable to our current healthcare climate and operations. And she agrees with Mr. Mastrata that partnerships are really um, very much needed and that academia reflects real-time practice across all settings and allows for an easier transition for students. Any other questions or comments? The floor is yours. I'm not hearing any. I want to thank our center director, Dr. Demetrius Porsche, and our core faculty member, Dr. Wiggins and our esteemed members of our dyads that presented today. Again, we are going to send out the evaluation link once you verify attendance in today's event. And we'd like to thank you for your interest in our program and participating today in our GBI Global Solution Room. And with that, we're gonna close out the program. Thank you to everyone. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.